Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of orbital theory. So today we're going to be talking about how to build up molecular orbitals uh, from our starting atomic orbitals. So we're going to be approaching this in the same general uh, technique we have uh, before, but with a little bit more systematic detail. And this is essentially the true beginning of molecular orbital theory, which we'll try and develop here over the next week or two. So uh, we're going to start with a very similar approach that we did for valence bond theory, uh, where we're going to try and build up our wave functions for molecules, or our MOs, from our atomic orbitals using our good old friend linear combinations. So it is worth noting that in reality, when we're dealing with MOs, what we're really dealing with is orbitals that are going to be distributed across an entire molecule and not just over one or two atoms. However, not too surprisingly, that gets a little bit messy. So we're gonna start with something a little bit simpler. So we're going to be uh, trying to address uh, uh, a system with a single electron. So I'm still dealing with a molecule, but I'm going to be looking at one molecule with one electron. One of the benefits of this is we don't have to deal with all this messiness of electron-electron repulsion, which as we saw with the atomic systems was quite messy. But just like for our multi-electronic atoms, once we have the single electron form, we can try and extend this to a multi-electron form by adding a series of corrections. So again, this idea, we're gonna start with something simple and build up to something a little bit more complex. So I need a, a molecular system that has a single electron. So let's go as simple as I can. Let's go with a molecular hydrogen ion. So this is H2 plus. So this means I've got two protons, which for convenience, I'm gonna label as A and B. And then we are going to have this single electron interacting with A at some distance RA and with uh, proton B at some distance RB. And we're gonna have a bond length in between these two atoms with some distance R. So when I put this all together, I have a relatively simple molecule. Now, if I want to try and figure out how to treat a electronic system, because that's really what we're dealing with here, we have to start with our good old friend, the Schrodinger equation, which means we need a Hamiltonian. So we're going to build this up rather similarly to what we did for the multi-electron Hamiltonian, uh, where we're going to start with the simplest case possible one electron with its own kinetic energy. My nuclei are rather heavy, so I'm going to ignore their kinetic energy value. And then I have all these wonderful, messy electrostatic thingies that I have to deal with, both electrostatic attraction and repulsion. So doing what we do, we take all of that messiness and drop it down to a single term. So our potential is going to embody all of this uh, electrostatic properties, which we get really lucky here because each proton has a charge of one and so does our electron. So we can simply phrase uh, a prefactor with the attractive version of a single charge interacting with itself through space. So we've seen this basic uh, prefactor before, but just as a reminder, we're ignoring any sort of multiplicity of charge because Yay, protons. And then we have to factor in how close the electron is to atom A with RA and how close the electron is to atom B with RB. So this set of expressions is gonna deal with all of my attractive terms. But if everything was attractive, it would all be sitting in a massive lump. So we also have an extra repulsion term, which is the fact that these two nuclei don't wanna be anywhere near each other. So this is also gonna scale as one to R. And so what we're really looking for when we're building up a molecule is trying to balance these terms. The attractive nature of the electron with the repulsive nature of the, proton, of the protons. 
And so altogether, especially when we feature in our kinetic energy, we end up with a massive balancing act. So this generates our Hamiltonian, a little bit too messy, but not too bad. But we also have the other part of our Schrodinger equation. We now have a, work a workable Hamiltonian. Turns out we also need a working wave function. So we're going to try and build up our wave function for this Hamiltonian more or less the same way we did with Vesper, but with a little bit more detail. So we're going to make a linear combination of our two available 1s atomic orbitals. So these are our good old friend, the 1s hydrogen orbital. And this theory is called linear combinations of atomic orbitals for a reason. So I've got two 1s orbitals. And as we've seen before, there's two ways I can put this together, either a symmetric or an anti-symmetric function. So we've seen this basic form before, but what we've been more or less ignoring until now is this normalization factor. So we know as we uh, approached before, if I've got two atoms of the same type, these two uh, uh, wave functions will have an identical prefactor. So that will get more or less pulled out here into the normalization constant. And again, their ratio can just be related to their prefactor, one squared. So we've got one to one, relation in between my two component wave functions. And now I have to figure out what on earth this normalization constant is. But before we do this, what we should really uh, note is that this is going to produce some sort of overlap between our set of orthonormal orbitals. So again, this is gonna be an orthonormal set on one. This is gonna be an orthonormal set on the other. While both are orthogonal, we don't, or normalized, we don't know how orthogonal they are with each other, which is what's gonna produce an overlap, which we're interested in because this is how we define a sigma bond like we've seen before in valence bond theory. So as we've seen before, uh, our symmetric wave function is going to form the low energy solution and the asymmetric is gonna be forming the high energy. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but for now, we want to tend to focus on the low energy form. So let's try and start by normalizing our symmetric combination. So we'll go ahead and take this wave function and normalize it. So when trying out how to figure out how to normalize a wave function, we need to start by taking the integral of the probability density. So I'll take the wave function, multiply it by its complex conjugate, and then integrate over all space. So when we do this, we can then insert, uh, insert the equational form we already had. So what we end up with is our normalization constant will get squared, and then the actual combined wave function gets squared. So not too bad. And because of the definition of normality, if I integrate over all space, this has to equal one. So right now we're mostly playing with definitions. But from here on, we're gonna play with a little bit of math. Because it turns out that trying uh, that while I can pull my normalization constant out in front of the integral, it's kind of hard to integrate a squared function. So we're going to want to tend to foil this guy out. So we end up with the wave function of a squared, the wave function of b squared, and two times the combined wave function. Uh, because these wave functions for the hydrogen 1s orbital are real, I went ahead and dropped the complex conjugate because turns out we don't need it in this case. So now trying to figure out how to solve this integral, we can use a classic trick. If I'm taking the integral of a sum, it's the same as the sum of the integrals. So let's go ahead and distribute out that integral. It's a little bit longer to write out, but the big advantage is now I've got three much simpler integrals to solve, and this still all equals one. Now, some of these forms should look pretty familiar because as I said, uh, our two, our hydrogen orbitals are indeed orthonormal, which means if I take the integral of a uh, normalized wave function over all space, this gets me a value of one. And that's gonna be the true for the integral of the 1s orbital over atom A and atom B.
So this seriously simplified my equation. As this term drops to one, this term drops to one, and all I'm left with is, well, the normalization constant I'm trying to figure out, and this much messier integral. We're gonna be talking about this guy a lot, but for now, we're just going to define it as the overlap integral. So this is literally uh, the idea of how much my two characteristic wave functions end up overlapping. And we give it a variable s and a corresponding value. And so when you hear me talk about the overlap integral or s, this is what I'm talking about. And not too surprisingly, the extent at which my two wave functions overlap is going to be highly dependent upon how close the center of each of those wave functions is to each other. So I've got two, uh, two spheres, closer they are, larger the overlap, further away, the less overlap. And it turns out that I can actually solve the value of s directly as long as I know the distance r. And we're going to play around with that later. But for now, I'm just going to use this as a definitional form, s. So I now have an expression for each of my three terms. So using my overlap integral and the definition of my two uh, normalized wave functions, I can go ahead and solve for my normalization constant. So I have my first term drops to one, one, and then twice the s. So this whole inner term will drop down to two plus two s. Well, we can make this a little bit more convenient and pull my factor of two outside the parentheses, and then I'll have the normalization constant squared times two times one plus s. And again, because we're looking at normalization, it all ends up equaling one. So with a little bit of algebra magic, we can go ahead and rearrange this equation to give us the normalization constant for the symmetric combination, because note, we'll have a different form for the asymmetric combination, which you'll be asked to solve for in the homework. Uh, but the normalization constant for the symmetric form will be related to the inverse of the square root of two times one plus s. Now, what's really important to note here is that we're gonna have an inverse relationship in between the normalization constant and our overlap integral. The larger the overlap integral, the smaller the value of the normalization constant. And this makes a certain amount of sense because the more overlap between the two wave functions, the more that wave function gets smeared out to cover this extra overlap term. And so we'll see a lot of our original amplitude end up dampening as it gets stolen by this overlap portion. So this is actually pretty cool and turns out to be fairly useful. So turns out we can solve this for our simple hydrogen ion case. So if I'm looking at a ground state or equilibrium hydrogen ion, a hydrogen molecule ion, then it turns out that my equilibrium bond length is about 2.5 Bohr radii, and that my equilibrium value for my overlap integral is 0.59. Plug that all in, and it turns out we have a normalization constant of 0.56. So what this roughly means is that each of these uh, individual wave functions will have about a contribution of half what they originally would have. And you can also figure out roughly the contribution of the overlap as well. So using this, you can figure out a lot about how much of the density is in any of these three regions, which again is a pretty cool feature. So we can then take our new expression for our uh, normalization constant and pair it together with our general form of the wave function. So again, for this symmetric combination of the wave function, I'll have the normalization times my two original atomic orbitals added together. Now let's take a look at what this actually looks like when I put it all together. So this again is just going to be a constant that depends on s. And my hydrogen orbitals are just my classic 1s hydrogen orbitals. They're a nice, big, ugly normalization constant times an exponential, which will decrease with the distance of the electron from atom A 
and then that's wave function A. And then for the wave function of the electron around B, it's the same thing, normalization, and then an exponential decay around atom B. So we can then take all of this and put it together. And what you'll notice is that these two normalization constants are exactly identical. So why keep them separate? Let's pull them out, throw them under the square root with everything else. And then what I have is a decay func as a normalization constant, which will just make sure that my integral works out. But the actual shape is going to be controlled by an exponential decay around atom A added with an exponential decay around atom B. And so what this means is that I'm going to have the maximum uh, wave function somewhere along my bond. This is where everything's going to be maximized. With it, uh, with it turning out that the indeed the maximum of each wave of the wave function will be around each of the centers, but there's a fairly heavy probability along this bond. And then no matter where I go uh, from there, it's going to increase both of these distances. So as I get further in, away from that center line, Turns out my probability will essentially undergo an exponential decay till essentially we have a uh, slightly oblong sphere centered around the atom. And so this is the bonding orbital. We have an increase of probability density around the center and then decreasingly likely to see the electrons the further away we get. Now you can do the same exact procedure for the anti-symmetric combination. Biggest notable difference is we now have introduced a negative term in between these two functions. And this has some really profound consequences. As you have a positive wave function around uh, atom A, and then a negative wave function around atom B with exponential decays from each one. Now, what's important to note is if I'm equally distant from both of these atoms, they'll cancel out and I will have a zero wave function cutting right down the middle. Congratulations, we have a node cutting straight through the bond. So when we put this together, what we end up having is a bonding and an anti-bonding orbital. So we're gonna spend the next two lectures going into a little bit more depth of the details of bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals. See you then, take care and stay healthy.